How you guys doing this evening? Thank you for your commitment to the local church, even in the face of the weather report. We believe that God is bigger than the weather, and we're praying for our city. We're praying for the protection and safety of everybody, and Lord, hold the rain, and if it does have to rain, let it be less than what they said, and uh, get us home safely, and let there be no accidents or issues, and you be glorified even in the rain. We're not afraid of rain because we got seed in the ground. So we are thankful even for natural and spiritual rain. Once you have given your offering, I just want you to do me a favor and just, if you have a hand free, lift it up. If you got two, lift them up because this is Holy Week. Amen. This is the week where Jesus laid it all on the line. And if there was ever a moment where he should get glory, this is that moment. Who may ascend to the Mount of the Most High? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Take a look at your hands because the enemy wants you to think that they're dirty, but because of what Jesus did, they're clean and you can lift them and you can praise and you can shout and you can shout unapologetically and unashamedly. And if there was ever a week where we would give God radical praise, this would be that week. If there was ever a time to put our hands together, this would be that time. If there was ever a Wednesday, it would be the Wednesday before Good Friday, before Resurrection Sunday. And I ain't waiting till the weekend to give God what he is due. And so we lift up the name of Jesus tonight. And we say, God, we thank you. And we bless you. And we lift you up. Now speak through your words so that we are closer to you when this moment is over than we were when it first began. We love you, we honor you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a great praise as you take your seat. There are some times when, uh, as preachers and, and communicators, we may take it easy. But then there are other times when the intensity and the importance of the moment requires another level of discernment and passion. And this is one such moment. This is Holy Week. This is Easter Week. This is where it all happened. And I am overwhelmed to think about the fact that I was thought about before this moment. I'll say again that it's amazing and overwhelming to think about the fact that I was thought about before this moment. <laughs> Thinking about your life, about what you've gone through, the experiences you've had, you are a miracle. Your life is a miracle. And if you don't know it, I'm gonna say it again until you get in your spirit that you should have been gone a long time ago. There were so many things that the enemy tried to do and God blocked them. He blocked them. He blocked them. Is there anybody other than me that God blocked the attack? He blocked the plot, the plan. And maybe you don't have everything in your life. And of course, no life is perfect. We've all done things we wish we hadn't. But the reality is every time we woke up, we woke up with the love of God hovering over us. And that is worthy of a hallelujah. It is worthy of a great heart of thanksgiving. And not just a shout on a Wednesday, but the life we live on Thursday. This whole thing was a trial, you know. This whole thing, this is a trial. We're not going to be here long. We, you know, if by reason of great strength you reach 80, that's great. 90, 100, amen. But after this is eternity. And that's when we all get to worship and glory. <laughs> but what is the purpose and meaning of life for the time that we have right now? And as I want to give greetings to our visitors, first, second, and third time, again, this is a moment where we should assess what is the purpose and the meaning of all things. Jesus, who we worship rightfully, and in two days we celebrate 
on Good Friday, and we will have Good Friday service right here, and we will have worship and the Word, and our leadership will be here. I'll be bringing a message, and our pastors will be here, and you need to be here because Good Friday is more important to me to me than anything else because all of the other things we do don't matter if Friday doesn't come. He died. And why did Jesus die? He died for y'all sitting in them green chairs. Yeah, or if you're on the main floor, the purple chairs. Good for you. And those who are watching online, he died for you as well. Why did he have to die? Where did this whole thing start? Well, this whole thing is a trial. God is the righteous judge. But let's break it down a minute and let's talk this thing through. Because if there is a trial, then there is a prosecution and there is a defense. And there is something in the atmosphere because we're in a very judgmental moment in time, where people are quick to judge others without knowing the whole story. We judge people based on things like where they come from and what their educational background is or what they look like or what, or what, or what we think we know from people we've heard. And maybe the information you got is not correct because the person who's bringing it doesn't like the person they're talking about. Be careful who you receive information from and make sure you understand the motive when you get it. I'm preaching already. This whole earth is a trial. There is a world that is more real than the world we are currently occupying. The Bible says that we believe that the things that were seen and that are seen were created from that which is unseen, that God spoke and out of nothing came something. There is a spiritual world more real than the physical world. You can't see it, but there are angels and demons, principalities in high places warring even now. There were whispers about it in the book of Daniel that when he fasted and prayed, it wasn't that God didn't hear him, but there was a principality over the, over the region stopping the answer of his prayer from getting to him, which means right above your head could be the answer to your prayer, but there might be a principality trying to keep you from getting it. So don't get upset at God. Get more passionate in your prayer. Get more passionate in your position, and maybe God will send help in heavenly places to bring to you what you've been praying for. I need somebody to stir up their gift tonight. My grandmother said you should expect miracles around Easter. She's in heaven now. She's a part of the great cloud of witnesses. But I still believe that Jesus can do miracles this week. Does anybody else believe that he can do it? Satan doesn't like you. In fact, he hates you. Jesus makes it clear that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Revelations 12 and 10 says this, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Somebody needs to get excited that trouble won't last always and that that devil that's been messing with you has a time limit on the attack on your life and he is being cast down. This is the worst week for Satan because he is constantly reminded of how little power he actually has because he thought he had the power on Friday and woke up on Sunday with nothing because Jesus took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And I need somebody to get a little excited in here because the cross was not the end. Five second praise break. <laughs> Satan wants to put humanity on trial. The book of Job, which is the earliest book in scripture 
It is not the first book chronologically. Genesis is the first book we read, but the first book written is Job. And in it, it gives you an insight into spiritual things and how spiritual things work. And the reason why that's important is because for the purposes of this message, I need you to understand why the devil keeps messing with you. Help me, Holy Ghost. You're on trial. The enemy wants to keep accusing you, bringing up evidence of the things you and I have done wrong. But I give you the title of this message and I'm gonna preach short so we can get home. But the title of the message is, I rest my case. I wish I, I, wish I was in a, I, I just wish I could act up, but I'm gonna say it again just for me, for all the times that the enemy has tried to shut my mouth tried to minimize my praise, tried to tell me I wasn't worthy, that I didn't have value, that I didn't deserve what God wanted to give me, that I was unqualified, that I didn't have what it took. I am so grateful that Jesus declared, I rest my. Somebody give Jesus a praise if you believe it. Satan wants to silence your mouth. Every time you lift your hands and start singing off key, it makes him so mad. <laughs> Gets on his nerves. And it's not your talent that he's angered by. It's your heart and the fact that God receives your worship, just, it just tears him apart. And if you notice in the book of Job, chapter one, starting at the sixth verse, it says these words, it gives you an intimate look into deep spiritual truths, how heaven operates and how the earth needs to shift. Now there was a day, this is Job chapter one, verse six, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. What happened in this exchange is that humanity was put on trial. God had an angelic census and all the angels showed up and the Bible says Satan showed up too. He didn't break into heaven because you can't sneak into heaven. I'm getting ready to help you to understand who Satan is and also who he's not. Because they got a whole horror movie genre to make Satan bigger than what he actually is. We make Satan to be this big malevolent being who can be anywhere at any time and possess anyone at any moment. And we even got some people with some bad theology that say, be careful who you pray for because that spirit could jump on you. <laughs> Where'd you read that? I haven't seen that in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Let me help you to understand something about the devil. The Bible says the sons of God showed up and Satan came too. Number one, there's a distinction between the two. But then the Bible says the Lord spoke to Satan and said, where'd you come from? And the Bible says Satan answered. Let me help you to understand something about authority, about power. He had to answer because he was under authority. When I'm in my house, I may answer if I want to, but I don't have to, because it's my house. But if you're in my house, and I want to know what you're here for, and you a visitor or a stranger, you better answer. I'm trying to help you. Satan has to answer to God. Oh, y'all missed that. 
Satan is not just some awesome, super scary thing that just he can do whatever he wants. He is on assignment, particularly in the life of a believer, and he cannot do anything in your life unless God allows it or ordains it. And if God allows it or ordains it, it is to bring about glory out of the situation. I'm trying to help somebody today. The enemy cannot just show up in your life if you have confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord. The blood has covered you. The Holy Spirit has been given to you as a deposit until the day of redemption. So yes, the enemy can oppress, but he cannot possess because he didn't pay for my soul, so he cannot occupy my soul. I need somebody to get... Tell somebody we're on trial. God said, hey man, you consider my servant Job, and he's faithful. That's my guy. <laughs> Satan was like, yeah, but his love is conditional. Why is the enemy messing with Job? Why does Satan hate us so much? Because God chose us over him. For those who don't know, Satan, according to scripture, was Lucifer, an anointed cherub who covers. He had instruments inside his body. He didn't need a band or singers. He was the band and the singers. He was the percussion, the rhythm, the drums, the bass, the piano, the keys, and he was the alto, soprano, tenor, and bass. He had it all, and he was so good at what he did and so beautiful when he did it that when he rebelled, a third of heaven's angels chose his gift over God's presence. That's why churches struggle today because we get enamored with people's gifts. But gifts don't mature, character does. I'd rather have a submitted worship leader with mediocre talent that is full with, filled with the Holy Ghost than a talented person with a great voice and no lifestyle. Ain't nobody gonna clap on that. It's all right, you know why? Because even in the church, we've gotten caught up in talent. But talent can't destroy no yoke. Talent can't make a demon leave your life. Talent doesn't make cancer shrivel up and die. You better have some anointing. You better have some power. And you better have a relationship with the living Jesus. Is there anybody that knows Jesus Christ makes all the difference? And I understand that we all come from different places, different backgrounds. We come from different denominations. And I honor the fact that we all come from different places. And even here in America, we have a geo-religious construct. Because if you go to California, they worship Jesus differently. In the Deep South, they worship Jesus differently. The Black Pentecostal Church is going to be a four-hour service, so pack a lunch. Lakewood's going to be 89 minutes, unless I'm preaching. And then it's going to be 98 minutes. Pray for me. But what's interesting to me is how the enemy has utilized our differences to keep us apart. Same Jesus, but we look at each other side eye. Mm -mm. I don't know what language that is. Apparently they call that tongues. That's a little weird. It's not really my bag of tricks. Somebody over here, oh, well, they don't speak in tongues. That means they don't have no Holy Ghost, so I certainly don't want to fool with them. Well, I'm apostolic. Well, I'm Methodist. Well, I'm Baptist. Well, I'm primitive Baptist. Well, I'm AME. Well, I'm non-denominational, which is a denomination, by the way. <laughs> All of these separations, organized brokenness, keeping us apart, and we took the bait. We've been on trial since the beginning of time, ever since God opened his mouth and said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Satan has been trying to prove to God that he made a mistake in choosing you over him. Which is why, Anzio, he keeps referring, 
he's being referred to in Revelation as the accuser of the brethren. And he doesn't just accuse Dr. Paul occasionally. The Bible says he accuses day and night. He is obsessed. He is absolutely consumed with trying to undermine and delegitimize your worship. He wants you to shut your mouth. He wants to prove to God that God was foolish and unwise in allowing you to get his position. Ooh, help me somebody. See, cause here's the thing, Satan's entire case, cause he's been building a case. How many people know Satan? You know he, he's, he's the accuser of the brother. And every time you do something wrong, oh, got him again, I got him. Just, you were in traffic, said the wrong thing, oh, got him. <laughs> Flipping through the channels, you were going to TBN, but you ended up on the wrong channel and saw some things, but you didn't delete it fast enough. You just stayed there for a minute. Then you heard somebody, uh-oh, keep, keep going to the Jesus ship. Yes, yes. Ooh, hallelujah. Oh. <laughs> He's looking for every imperfection. He's looking for any single thing that can cause God to disqualify you. Why? Because Satan had a position and he was so caught up in his position and he wants his position back. And of all the people that God chose to replace he, uh, Satan, he chose me and you. A being with, with thousands of vocal cords and instruments and we only got two vocal cords. Ooh, I'm getting ready to go somewhere. See, because Satan's still caught up in the talent thing. They can't even do what I do. God says, I don't need them to do what you do. I just need them to do what they're supposed to do. So, here's what the enemy is after. He's after your status as a son. Because we are now sons of God. You do know that. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You don't realize that position. How many parents do we have in here? How many people in here? How many men have a, a child named after them? How many, where am I, where am I? Stand up, sir, stand up. If you have a, a son named after you, stand up. Let me ask you something. When you have a son named after you, is there anything that you wouldn't do to protect that boy? Talk to me, fellas. If somebody was messing with your son, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> and this is Texas. So, so you already know it's Second Amendment all day long. Come for me and mine, and either I'm going to pray for you or I'm going to help you go see Jesus. It's one of the two. I might not even pray for you. <laughs> you have a son that has your name, which means they carry not only your DNA, but they carry your legacy. They can perpetuate your gifts, your calling. What you speak into them, they can take to the next generation. Now, watch this. How many gentlemen in here have a son? It may not be named after you, but it's still your son. Where yet? You at? Where are the fellas at? Stand up, fellas. I'm getting ready to show you something about, about how God looks at sonship. Jesus in Matthew, when he got baptized, God said this, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What had Jesus done up to that point? Nothing. He hadn't healed one person. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. No withered hands stretched out, no blind eyes open, no deaf ears open, but because he was a son, he had immediate status. I need you to know that no matter what you do, your status does not change with God. I'm trying to help not just the fellas, because ladies, you are also children of God, and for the purposes of this, sonship is a spiritual declaration, which means you can be female and still operate as a son, which means you have an inheritance with God, which means if anybody messes with you, they got to answer to your father. Yeah. 
Now watch this, before you sit down, I'm getting ready to help you with something. Your status is a son. You have a son, so he also has status. Anybody messing with my son, they're not just messing with John, they're messing with John Gray, the fourth. They're not just messing with Paul Jr. Is it Paul Jr.? Okay, okay. So, what's your son's name? Carmelo. All right, so Brandon, Brandon, Andrew, Montgomery, Bam. Your son is Carmelo, Andrew, Montgomery. So Bam and Cam. So if they don't, if they mess with Cam, they gonna get the Bam. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> because it's something that wakes up in us when somebody's messing with our son because sons carry seed and seed carries legacy and legacy carries purpose and purpose carries status and status carries authority and my status is a son but my seat is my authority. Watch this, gentlemen be seated. You just sat in your authority because authority is what you get when you don't have to try. I don't have to try to be anything because God already gave me my status. I'm a son, so when I speak, angels have to move because my dad has power. One person caught it. Young lady over here caught it. I don't have to yell. I don't have to jump up and down because of who my heavenly father is, I have status. There's something about being seated which lets you know you have authority. You don't believe me? Where is Jesus right now? Is he in the ground? No. Okay, is he on the cross? No. He is at the right hand, but where, what is he doing at the right hand? Tell somebody, be seated. Ooh, you missed it. When you tell somebody to be seated, you're not telling them to be less than, you're telling them to step up to the authority that you have as a child of God. I don't strive anymore, I'm seated. I don't yell, I don't, I don't beg for things, I'm seated. I don't hope they call, I know they're gonna call because I'm seated. I don't have to beg for forgiveness, the blood is already covered, so I'm seated. So my status is a son, my seat is authority. But what's the statement? Not guilty. Oh, well, I thought I would get a little different response from that. So let me break it down for you. When Job accused, when, when Satan accused Job, Satan's hope is that he would gather enough evidence to cause God to say, you know what, Satan, you're right. These clay creatures, these creatures from the dust are unworthy of my mercy, unworthy of my forgiveness. They're unworthy of all the favor that I've given them. I made a mistake. I should have given you another chance. Ah. But unfortunately, Satan didn't follow protocol. Because if you've ever studied trials, there are certain protocol that have to be handled. You can't just bring evidence. You gotta make sure the evidence was brought in properly. And if the evidence is tainted, it is inadmissible in court. So a person that has no integrity, if you lack integrity and you handle evidence, they strike the evidence because you can't be trusted. Rewind, Jesus said Satan is the father of lies. He's been lying from the beginning. So a liar doesn't have status in the court. Oh, I'm getting ready to preach it like I feel it. You can accuse all day. So you, 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 you can't bring the evidence because you can't be trusted. But also, you can't just walk up into a court and say whatever you want to a judge. You can't walk up and be like, what up, your judgeness? What's up, judgeship? Hi, what up, judgey judge? No, 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 no. You can't just walk in to a courtroom and speak to the judge any kind of way because if you do, they will hold you in. So Satan actually doesn't have standing in the presence of God because Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with and into his court with. 
Satan can't praise because he was kicked out of heaven, so he can't even get in the court. I'm getting ready to rest my case. We're getting ready to go home early, but I need somebody to catch where I'm going. Satan keeps trying to bring a case against you, but his evidence is tainted and his status is no good because God has already made up his mind. Unfortunately, it's called nepotism. Nepotism is when somebody who has power is related to you. What Satan didn't know is that the judge is also your dad. I know it's almost time to go, but if you were ever gonna shout, that was the place. The judge is your dad. And your defense attorney is your big brother and high priest. His name is Yeshua. Now he didn't go to law school, but he fulfilled the law and the prophets. He's a carpenter by trade, but he knows the book back and forth. Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do your will, oh God. And so, even as Satan brought the case against you, your defense attorney said, your honor, may I approach the bench? The bench was made of wood, two pieces, three nails. It was a Friday. The trial was set. We were in trouble. No hope, no plan. They got us on videotape. The jury has seen it. And as the judge was getting ready to slam the gavel, he said, stop. May I approach the bench? The evidence against John Gray is overwhelming. He sinned against you. He messes up every day. Can't get it together. He's big and sweaty. Not in shape. Look like a Christmas tree. Velvet and gold buttons. But he loves you. And he tries the best he can. Don't forget, Father, you made him from the dust. So every now and then, achoo, he shows a little dust every now and then. Tell somebody, bless you. Tell somebody, bless you. Satan saw where the case was going. He said, stop. Your word says. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. I got him on camera. He got the goat. The judge said, you're right. Somebody's got to die. Because the holiness of the judge means somebody has to pay for the sins they've committed. The judge said, I, the righteous God, find you, John Gray, guilty of crimes against my holiness, for the wages of sin is death. And I find you guilty. Slams the gavel down. Now the sentencing phase begins. The prosecution, Satan, and all his demons. We got him. This is what I'm talking about. You ain't going nowhere. You'll never be nothing. You're going to die. You won't be no preacher. You will be no pastor. Nothing. We got you, sinner. So sloppy. You ain't going to be nothing. You'll never perpetuate a legacy. The sentence for your crimes is death. It's to be carried out immediately. Jesus said, Your Honor. Your Honor, if it's blood you want, instead of just paying for him, I see a trail of humanity out the door. All of them are guilty too. So can I just pay for all of them?
Satan said, no, I want to put them all on trial. All of them, each one individually. Jesus hit him back. Because anytime Satan says something, Jesus always hit him with the word. The word says, through one, sin entered all. And through one, righteousness will enter all. I'm going to take his death so he can live my life. I need a sound that helps you to understand that you hear what I'm saying. I'll take his death so he can live my life. Take him away. John Gray, your sentence will be carried out on Friday. And your name will be attached to Jesus' back. His blood will be shed in replacement of you. You, John, are free to go. Jesus, I'll see you on Friday. And they beat him and they whipped him. Beyond recognition, his visage was marred more than any man. He led him as a sheep before his shearers is silent, yet he opened not his mouth. And he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. John 19 and 30 as the sentence was being carried out. For those of us who still leave church early after coming in late. <laughs> As the sentence was being carried out, for those of us who are still casual with the holy things of God, for those who choose not to believe, Jesus said, I'm dying just in case you decide to believe one day. John 19 and 30, Jesus says, it is finished. The debt has been paid. The veil has been torn. And everybody who has failed now has righteousness credited to your account. You are not what the devil says you are. You are what the blood says you are. I rest my My status is a son, my seat is authority, and my statement is not guilty. Every time the enemy tries to bring it up again, I'm gonna just declare not guilty. Tell somebody not guilty. Did you do it? Yeah, but I'm not guilty. Because I overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. And what I got freed from, I'm going to tell somebody else that if Jesus can do it for me, he can do it for them. And we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Tell somebody if God has ever freed you from anything, if he ever saved you from anything, you might as well go ahead and show some signs tonight. The sermon is over, but the praise is just beginning. Where are you guys from with the blue shirts? Norway. Norway. From Norway, and you're going to Zimbabwe, Zambia. You should go to Wakanda. It's really good this time. <laughs> you might find a Black Panther over there. I don't know. When you have received the gift of salvation, it motivates you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Like get on planes for two days to go to Zambia and do, do surgery for people for months at a time. No cameras there, probably a little bit of air conditioning, leaving family and loved ones, but the Holy Ghost is with him and we're with him and our prayers are with him and we celebrate you because you are an extension of the resurrection. 
and I'm talking to you, you, and even you, whoever you are, wherever you are, walk into that job tomorrow with some joy. Say hello to the people at the grocery store, and if they ask you why, why are you so happy? Because I'm not guilty. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Tell them not guilty. And even if somebody wants to bring up your past, because the devil always wants to bring up your past, remind him of his future. Tell somebody not guilty. And I'm not gonna let anybody judge me. And they can't judge you. Because all of them haters who got a list of everything you've ever done, if they tried to bring it into the court, it wouldn't make it. Because the only thing that gets in the court is praise and thanksgiving. Some of y'all just praised your way out of a generational curse. You just praised your way out of bondage. You just praised your marriage into a healthy place. Because some spirits can't stay in a praise atmosphere. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. It's Holy Week. A week when we should have been reminded of the worst things we've ever done. But the blood comes and washes over us and says, not guilty. The price has been paid. And Jesus rested his case on the cross. And he declared it is finished. And for all of us, I'll just say it, for me, who's messed up the most, and my brother who was honest and said him too. Lord, for those of us who know we don't deserve your mercy, we say thank you tonight. For those of us who have been the recipients of your grace, we say thank you tonight. Those have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. May we be reminded of the great sacrifice that was given so that we could lift our hands this day. I pray a blessing over every family, and I pray that salvation breaks out in this room in the next two minutes. God, I thank you. Thank you that you and 12 legion of angels will cover Dr. Paul as he travels to Zambia, I also declare that our brothers and sisters from Norway will go back to their homeland with a passion and a strength to serve and to sow and to bless this present age. And I thank you for every single person that came out tonight under threat of rain. Ain't gonna be no tornadoes, Jesus. Hold the rain and the hail till everybody gets home. It can rain all night. That'll help us sleep, Jesus. But it's not gonna rain while we're driving home. I declare it. You're in charge of the clouds. You're in charge of the clouds. You're in charge of our lives. And I thank you tonight. I thank you. I thank you for the blood. I thank you. Thank you for forgiveness. I thank you. Thank you for mercy. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, we don't do this often and we may not do it for a while, but security, prepare yourself because I'm gonna ask if you're getting saved tonight, start making your way to the altar. If you need to give your life to Jesus or you need to rededicate your life, get to this altar right now. Tonight is your night. Come on, sis. If you need to give your life to Jesus, come on. If you need to rededicate your life, come on. If you want to join this church, come on. If God was speaking to you tonight, come on. Welcome home. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been. You're always able to come home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. We can do better than that. People are giving their life to Jesus. Bless you. Welcome home. Hello, sweet girl. Welcome home. Bless you. Welcome home. Hello, my sister. Welcome home. Come here. 
Welcome home. Bless you, my man. Bless you, man of God. Bless you. Welcome home. Come on up. Come on up. People are giving their lives to Jesus tonight. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in law enforcement. May the Lord bless you and every man and woman in law enforcement. May the Lord cover you and protect you every day you're on the job. May he keep you all the days of your life. Not one bullet will come near you. You are protected. You will live and not die. And your partners will live and not die. And we declare blessing. And we thank you for the sacrifice that you made. And every other person in the military, armed services, EMT, firefighters, we pray a blessing over you tonight. To all my babies that are coming to get saved tonight, welcome home. Y'all, kids are getting saved. Grown folk getting saved. Grandparents getting saved. Welcome home. Welcome home. We are family. There's no judgment here. God is about souls. It's time for the church to open their eyes and love everybody. That's the power of the blood. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is the blood. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of, oh, oh. And what can make me whole again? Nothing, nothing but the blood I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I'm not guilty. Jesus paid the price. I am free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are my Lord and my Savior. I receive the free gift of salvation. The blood is real and it's active tonight. Thank you. My life is made new. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. We believe if you prayed that simple prayer, you just got saved. Welcome home.